This playthrough is rated T for teen. Alright, it's time to get more sand in my boots. Greetings and salutations, viewers. While we're back here with another episode of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. In the last episode, we got the bur Burning Brazier, or whatever, and, uh, you know, got the reward for that. Now we're on to the caves, and hopefully this cave will... We'll end up doing the same thing as the previous ones, right? We'll fight a villain at the bottom of it, you know, get the get the urn and uh, go home happy and get a reward, right? You know, it's fine. Anyway, yeah, we're still getting wrecked by these uh, undead um, pirates or whatever. <coughs> Who knew undead could use a or zombies could use a two swords? I don't think they're technically zombies. I think they're like something else, but I don't remember their exact. Because obviously they're smarter. Because most zombies just run in and punch you, that type of thing. But these guys are a bit more aggressive, but I don't remember what type of undead they are. Just know that they're undead. They could be just upgraded undead. Hmm. That's annoying to have all of them come at me at once. Sometimes if you can get a <coughs> a bit of rain, a bit away from them, you can uh, keep them empty. Or <coughs> keep them empty. Keep them uh, like away from you and just you know, pull one dude in at a time. I wonder if I could... Get a few. You know, the problem with this is he can block. So ranged a lot of times is not useful. Uh, if they have shields or weapons to block with. If it's like a you know a dog or something that they can't uh, block like a hellhound, yeah, it's fine, but <coughs> so these guys, nope, you gotta you gotta go all the way. Alright. See what's in here. A little light, a little ambiance, and you could have yourself a fancy restaurant. You know, on, on the on the wharf or something like that. You know, on the on the dock of the bay, just like that one sh uh, uh, song. I don't remember. That goes something on the dock of the bay, something like that. Anyway, man, yeah, we're just going here, fighting zombies, getting getting sand everywhere. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough, gets everywhere. You know how it is. Vader knows best. Man, that's so. I don't, whoa, what the? I can't escape. No. Got a, we got ourselves trapped here. I mean, it's not much different than before, really. Did he just try to... I mean, he's trying to double-hand it like uh, Dritz to Wirton over here. Or actually, more like Artemis from Trary. Dritz's rival. Sort of. He's a rival for a while, but then when the 4th uh, edition version of the Dritz to Wirton books came about, he stopped being a... Well, there's a reason for that, but he stopped being a rival. It kind of just stopped. There was an interesting series of books about him after his uh, encounters with Dritz, with uh, the Jar Axel, the, uh, the the mercenary. Um, he's also another drow that uh, takes advantage of people through you know commerce and his band, uh, Brigand Day Earth, I believe was the name of his uh, rogue band from uh, Imism Branson. Man, I can't believe I remember all these names. It's been forever since I've read the books. Oh, that's why we couldn't run. We got a new enemy here, Captain Chorus. Chorus? Is he part of the chorus? All right. Well, I mean, he's basically just a upgraded version of his uh, of his uh, counterpart of his uh, undead, um, like I guess, uh, uh, crewman. I guess if you want to go specific, he keeps trying to like punch me or something like that. No, I think he's using like a piercing attack on me or something like that. You know, we just have to do the whole. No. Didn't even hit him there. Yeah, we're, play we're playing this game, aren't we? He's trying to get, like, a hit on me. And then he, uh... And he holds off for a second as he tries to do it. I mean, he's a I mean, obviously, he's more powerful than his crew. So he'll do a bit of damage if not cut. Oh, he's got a gun! That's why he's... Like, tr he's trying to aim at me and hit me. But, uh... I'm, I'm not standing far away from him, so... He has to use the sword, or he's, he's trying to shoot me, but sometimes, I mean, sometimes he'll slice me with the sword. No Oceanic Horror. The undead pirates no longer possess the Oceanic Urn. Perhaps it lies in the legendary sea temple said to be beneath the Seer's Island. What? I thought I was here to get the get this Oceanic Urn. We were supposed to fight a boss and get there already. Ooh, I'm mid. Well, plus three grand one shield. If I would use shields, that would have been awesome. But nope. I oh, got a runestone. Nice. I will eventually start giving myself good gear. We've got enough rune stones, and I don't need anything plus. I, there's only like one or two gear I want to get at plus five. And by the way, during the main storyline, you can only get up to plus five if you're playing like easy, normal, or hard mode. 
if you play extreme mode, um, you can actually get up to plus 15, but only on extreme mode. So anyway, let's enter the sea temple and see if we can find the oceanic urn. So it looks like the undead captain did not have it, but perhaps, uh, uh, no, I have sufficient space. I don't know what, it does that sometimes when I play a game, it says insufficient. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, dude. I guess the thing's just being wonky. It is an old console, so. Secret over here. Yes. Yes. A treasure. There are moon letters here. See? But, uh, yeah, not just a simple cavern. Of course, there's a temple underneath this place that uh, holds some nasty secrets. Hopefully, we won't have to fight any more undead and things I can actually stun. Please? Looks like we got bully wugs over here. At least they're fleshy, so we can actually stun them. Man, I hardly ever use bully wugs in, in my games. They're basically frogmen, for all intents and purposes. But we can stun them, and that makes them awesome. For me to poop on, I mean for me to kill them. Maybe I should start upgrading my stunning blow. I, I do like hardly any damage when I stun them. But then again, the whole point of the stunning blow is to stun them, so it does, it's not really meant for damage. At least that's not my feeling on it. I mean, the, really, the only reason I'd want to upgrade Stunning Blow is to, uh, at least until I, you know, I don't have anything else to spend it on. Although I'd probably upgrade it first before some of the other abilities, but is to increase the stun rate that you get, uh, that is active when you stun someone. Oh. Actually, this might be a good chance to use some of the money. And... I can't hold really, I don't have enough money for a ring stone. You better not be gone by the time I get back. All right, I think it actually is time to uh, do some. Uh, I give myself one of the rings. I'm gonna get for the end game stuff. I mean, we're still a while from the end game, but you know what I mean. Alright, for workshop, well, actually, let's sell stuff first before I do that, so. Alright, just take out all that stuff. Uh, let's see, don't need that. Helmet. How's the helmet? Uh, yeah, no. Nowhere there. Nope. Nope. Now we got a helmet of speed. But I'm gonna just break that down for the moonstone. Let's see, brand one shield, and yeah, you can't break that. You can't get rune stones from it. Unfortunately, I wish you could, but yeah, sell a few of those. Luckily, these uh, luckily these gemstones don't uh, don't weigh very much. Let's see, yeah, we'll sell those. Okay, so all right, let's workshop. Let's break down. That you helmet, no so we can get the runestone. Oops. Yes. No one will sell that. <clears throat> How much do I have in uh, runestones, really quick? Let's see. So you need another descent. I think I've got enough runestones. I only want to do a plus two for now. Yeah, I've got enough of that. So I want to get another descent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down the grand fire ring I've got already so I can get the descent from that. And then I'll just uh, reuse that ring. Um, and then I want to buy a couple of aquamarines. A little pricey, but we'll, we'll do that. Right and then I want to workshop that ring. <clears throat> Let's put two in there to get, make it a plus two. And so what it is, it's one rune ring to get plus one, two rune rings to uh, two rune stones to get plus two, then four for plus three, uh, and then it goes. I think it's twelve and then fifteen or something like that. I'll have to look that up later. But yeah, you need the same amount of rune stones as you do the gems of what you want to upgrade. So I'm gonna take the two descents there to make it a ring of fire. But I also want to add something else to it because it'll give, make it plus two strength. But I want to add um, Aquamarines, because that what that makes it a ring of cold fire. And what that gives is plus two strength, plus two intelligence. So it'll give me a little bit more mana, mainly for the strength. I want mainly for the strength part. But anyway, if I put it together, it'll be 24,000 gold. So let's go and do that. So now we got an upgrade for our ring. <coughs> so now let's equip that. Unfortunately, it puts it way down at the bottom, but oh well. So now our stats are, you know, 12 intelligence. Strength is a little off because obviously it was a plus. Uh, but next, next when I get to level 20, I'm going to 
bump my strength up again, so we'll get that up to 16. I do actually want to make another ring of uh, <coughs> cold fire. Another plus two ring of cold fire, but not right now. I'll do that off of this ring when I break it down so I can sell the other rings I've got. Uh, yeah, sell that. Okay. And obviously more strength means I can hold more stuff outside of buying the... Uh, the one, uh, one ability, so grab that. All right, grab that. All right, let's keep going. And like I said, with little bits of money over time, I'll eventually buff all that. Obviously, the stuff I want to have plus five will be like my gloves <coughs> and some of my armor, but I'm waiting until end game stuff before I do that. And hopefully, I'll have enough strength by then so I can don't have to make a, another set of armor that's a plus five, you know, fey touched uh, armor that's like light on weight. I can actually. You know, do the best. Oh, did I have? No, I had it there. It's just <clears throat> I was getting stun locked too many times. There we go. You want to come up? Ooh, they're getting some good hits on me. <clears throat> but nothing I can't handle. Not with a little healing potion that uh, that won't help. So, or it will help. I mean. Yeah, I'm so glad this place has a area of people you can stun. Yeah, those uh, those undead skeletons were kind of giving me the work. Work, let me tell you, they kept hitting me for a ton of damage. Although I am not, I'm not suboptimally built because I don't have a, or I am suboptimally built because uh, I'm not, I don't have the best armor right now. So I said I want my strength to be built up a little bit more before I. <coughs> I gotta be careful. Yeah, they're getting a couple of good smacks on me. Ooh, slow down. Slow down! Now, I know sometimes I'll miss with the uh, with the stunning fist, so I have to be a bit careful. Maybe my plus to hit is down. I will eventually get other stat increases as well, so. Alright, Mark I'll sell you later. Uh oh. Alright. And I think by the end of the game, I think I'll probably end up pumping the rest of my levels up into strength. I probably should have done that earlier and not even messed with Khan, but I wanted to have a little bit of extra extra health as well as uh, regeneration. So, probably if you want to be more optimal, I probably would say just put all your bumps into strength for the most part. Because most classes easily benefit from strength, not just for carrying equipment, but more damage and easier to hit. So. I just want a little little bit of extra insurance, you know, for a little, little bit of extra HP and all that. So, Man, you guys are, are a little hand, hand, bit of a handful. Oof, got water here. Cause a bit of a slowdown. Yeah, anything like either fire or a lot of water ripples will cause a little bit of a slowdown for for this game. Obviously, if you play the Switch version or whatever new version that came out for this, obviously that's not the case. They fixed that, but back in the day, it was my, it didn't happen all the time, but it was like a case of too many obstacles appeared on screen and you'd have a little bit of issue. I don't remember it being too common, but... Man, now they're throwing like spears. They're like chucking spears at me. Don't do that. Don't be a spear chucker. That's not cool. People don't like that. I don't like it. He wants you dead? Oh wait, that's it. Oh, wait. Oh. I, don't, I kept pressing square. I was like, how am I missing that? I mean, my, I have it in mind while playing this game. It's just to spam the square button so to make sure I grab everything. But you'd be surprised how often I still miss stuff. No, oh, anyway. Yeah, I was uh, saying in a previous episode how I don't really use underwater areas like this. I don't know why. I mean, I, if I do it, I just do it to, to mess with my players and, and piss them off and they have to fight in the water because I hate doing that. And I do it to them every time I, I run an adventure. I always get them in the underwater section. Although I think my players are on to me because in my recent game, they learned they learned a water water breathing ritual, which means they can just do it for 24-7, so now they don't have to worry about getting drowned. So now the only thing they have to worry about is just getting thrown into the water for the purposes of, of uh, fighting in there. Although... I'm probably going to end up dispelling that spell at some point, just to, that when they least expect it, so they, they have to breathe the water or something like that. Because you know enemies can cast spells like Dispelling Magic and stuff like that. They know that, right? I hope they do, because they're going to be in for a surprise. I'm one of those DMs I like to give my players combat challenges or puzzles every once in a while. 
So not every battle. I mean, every once in a while, I'll give my my players a easy, easy battle. You know, something to curb stomp something just for the because you know every everyone who plays D and D wants that one encounter or two that where they just curb stomp an enemy because they want to show off their power. But uh, I can't do that all the time. For me, that's kind of boring, and I know it for them that actually is kind of boring. They every, they only want to do it every once in a while, just to get like stress release or something like that. But yeah, I, I sometimes I maybe go a little overboard with. With uh, with uh, doing challenges, you know. I mean, the players haven't s haven't said anything to me, but I don't know. I feel like I go maybe a little reward some days. Maybe they're just trying to be nice. But I am the I am the forever GM of the group, so or DM, however you want to put it. What that means, folks, is that I'm basically a person who will always be a, a, a GM and never, almost never a player, because in the world of D and D, more people want to play than they actually want to run the game. And I'm just one of those people that actually likes kind of running games. I'm so used to it. I've been doing it since I was like, God, how young was I when I started playing? I think it was like eight or something like that when I first, either eight or seven when I first ran my game because I was really into it. So I don't do it as much as I used to. I, I'm one of those guys who plays like maybe once or twice a month at best. And even then, it might be a few months before I get to it. really depends on what's going on. But yeah, I don't know. I just like, I just like running the game. I like pr pr pretending to be God and telling stories even if they're not good stories i still like telling them anyway that's why people keep thinking i should be i sh i need to do i mean i do that that's why i do a little bit of writing on the side but i don't really have anything published that's worth mentioning you know in the world of publishing you just you basically have to write and write and write and just hopefully you make a little bit of money but really unless you unless you get lucky like tolkien or martin or uh, rowling or something like that you're pretty much going to be writing for the rest of your days most people don't get that like one book deal and that'll set them up for the rest of their days. Like that's, I wouldn't say an impossibility, but that's really hard. You really have to like get lucky to get something like that. There's people that get close and they get like TV deals. Too many writers these days just try to like write something and try and get a TV deal instead of doing it for the, per for the you know, benefit of just writing and expressing themselves and stuff like that. And either that or they they went off to, they went to go writing for like television or something like that, but most current writers for television aren't very good, so I don't know about that. But yeah, so forever forever GM. I do get to play every once in a while, but I'm I'm so used to being a GM, it's kind of hard for me to get into the role of a player. Actually, I usually like overcomplicate things as a player or question the GM on their decisions all the time, which is a dick move to do, by the way. Rule of thumb: Don't don't question a GM when you're playing unless it's a legitimate like issue or concern you have, like how the game is run or something like that. But don't bug him on every single decision because you know they are the they are quote unquote the rules masters of, of that game. So you know, and usually the rule of thumb is that whatever the GM says goes. Sometimes you can convince a GM or dungeon master, however, whichever. I usually, if I play dun if I play D and D, I'm a dungeon master. If I'm uh, playing any other gaming system, I usually just call myself a game master. Unless I'm playing a Deadlands and I'm the marshal. Uh, yeah, rule of thumb is the what the DM's rule is law, or you know, uh, what if the DM says that's it, then that's it. You know, you go on with the game. So unless the GM's a dick, which is possible. You know, the whole the problem with GMs is some people like let it get to their heads. You know. And sometimes it might happen to me, but I try not to have that happen to me because I just like, you know, DM uh, playing games is just like a, 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 you know, it's fun to run a story, but it's also a reason for people to get together. And I'm an introvert, and I usually don't like getting together. But every once in a while, the, like I said, the one or twice a month, I'll let myself do that for, you know, I'm not so introverted that I never want to see people, but I don't like it. So, so this is the way one of the few times I get, I break out just to. I'm one of those introverts that like you get tired if you're around people for too long. It, like just a weariness goes over your your body, and you, you just can't. You just don't want to handle it anymore. And you just want to go away or something like that and be by yourself. That's pretty much how it is. Yeah, the sad thing, although the sad thing about being a forever GM is it's hard to talk about your hobby with people. If you tell people you're a GM, people will immediately want to join your game or or get you to run games for them because they don't have a GM of their own, or they, or it's a G, or you talk to a fellow GM and he wants to be a player, so he uh, he tries to convince you to uh, um, GM for his group, and you're like, I've already got like a couple of groups already. I don't need more. 
Yeah, I've already got quite a few groups I already played through, so it's like I don't I don't need more right now, so thanks for calling though. Now I probably would do it if someone paid me to do it. Although that's kinda that's kinda cheapens the game a little bit if you ask for money to be a D GM, but ooh, boots is training. Um but we call them it's okay, nice. You know, I, I probably will have a use for Moonstones. I'll have to look up my notes later on for in-game stuff. Uh, Alright, let's, uh, yeah, let's go down to the next floor. And, uh, but yeah, if people paid me, I would consider it. But like I said, there's usually some something, like, weird about asking people money to run a game. I don't know, because of the, ho way the, the way the hobby is. Usually most people pay the GM and pizza and stuff like that like when he runs the game so basically they feed him and take care of him because he's the one who runs the games so. and it's usually a good rule of thumb if you're not the gm you should probably bring food or snacks or something like that if you're playing a, a game or something like that just because so you're con contributing not just being there you know if you're not going to contribute to the story at least contribute to the food you know what i mean there's so many players that do almost just like they feel like they want the GM to do all the work and all they do is they're the body and that they all they have to do is show up, which is a rather crude way of thinking about it. I mean, it is still a game and it's still a group effort, so, you know, it's like being the leech of the group if you don't contribute something outside of being the player, you know. Yeah, it's in a whole etiquette of Dungeons & Dragons or just gaming in general. A lot of young people don't get that, you know. Because, you know, the generation past mine, the millennials, I'm a Gen Z. I think technically I'm Gen Z. I'll have to look it up again. But anyone past my time, millennials and, and uh, oh, no, Gen X. I think I'm Gen X. Uh, Gen Z is, I believe, the the generation after millennials, I think. I don't remember. Anyway, I'm, a, I'm from the 80s generation, so not a millennial. Um, anyway, everyone, all the, all the kids after my generation are a little bit more me, 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 me crowd, so me, 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 mine, 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 now, now, now. So I know not everyone's like that, but that is definitely a kind of the feeling I get from this generation and the generation onward, like my my nephew's generation, or niece, well, actually, she, my niece is too young for that generation. She's in her own generation bracket. So, uh, although technically my, uh, my, uh, the lock won't hmm. open. Technically, my uh, my nephew is not not a millennial because he's born after 2000. So I think he's Gen Z. I, I don't know. They always change it every year, like what the like what the rating is between different people and everything like that. But anyway, yeah, just uh, yeah, most young people don't know the etiquette. So yeah, if you play to play with old gamers, you can kind of tell what era they're from or like you know how they how they play the game and expect it to be run and everything with that but then newer players are usually very distracted by their phones and everything with that so it's hard for them to get it's hard to get them invested i've tried to run games for yet younger players it's kind of hard to get them like despite you know people saying they like my style they because they're so distracted with modern technology it's hard for them to get off their phones for one gosh darn second and pay attention you know it's like Dude, why are you even here if you don't care enough to like play the game or or like uh or uh, or listen or whatever you know? It's rude. So, like, might as well just go go play on your phone or go play a mobile game if you're gonna do that. So, I don't know. Although usually, because I mean, the reason it's like that is because you know Dungeons Dragons become so mainstream because of people like Critical Role, which I don't blame Critical Role for this. They they're just friends who just happen to be voice actors who just happen to like get something going on and they became popular because of that so that's not their fault it's just what came of it the and that's not their responsibility it's just you know generally the, the etiquette what came from it it's probably not been the best and it's probably why the the um now the door opens that's probably why the era of dungeon dragons is so sanitized now because so many people have jumped into the game so now they want to get more people into it to make more money and I'll admit, gaming has never been the most lucrative hobby. If you're into, if you're making a game, you're probably always having to work on. As soon as you release something and sell it, you're working, you're immediately working on the next product, so you can, you know, keep making money for your company. Because, like I said, gaming is one of those things where you just have to buy a book. You have to buy the the player's book or the main book, and that's it. You don't have to buy any expansions for it. Same with D and D. You only have to buy one book. That's why, like later on in D and D's, like I think when. Uh, 
TSR got sold to Wizards of the Coast or whatever, they started trying to release books like every month, so they were getting people to try and buy stuff on a regular basis. And that was, it's not super cost effective because of just how, that it means it, ha it makes people choose what they have to buy. So you have to be kind of really careful about like trying to pump content out all the time without like stagnating the game. You know? And you know, the corporate mindset of always having to have something more than what's immediately necessary to keep running. So. Yeah, it's kind of sad that a game like uh, D&D has become so corporatized and everything like that. I mean, you can still play the game however you want. It's just, just the behind the scenes or the, or the merchandising side or the, you know, or the, the part that's to deal with the actual, you know, product is, is, I mean, it's been corporate ever since, you know, TSR, you know, when they got, bought the rights to the game from Gary Gygax way back in the day and then Wizard of the Coast, but yeah, it always been like that, but it doesn't make me feel any better when you, when you know about that. I mean, I'll, at least I'll give Critical World credit. That game made poor people more interested in the game, which, you know, the hobby always needed more new blood and fresh blood. Although, I don't know if I like some of the ideas some of the fresh blood has been bringing in, but, you know. I mean, at least the hobby hasn't died. Although, like I said, I don't know if I like the direction where it's going at. Sorry, I'm kind of doing the whole old man yelling at clouds situation here, so apologize. But that's just... That's what happens when you're in, a, when you're in something for too long and then it gets a kind of absorbed or overrun by a new group of people and you're like, eh, I remember the day when traps, when everything used to kill you in D&D, &D, there was no like resurrection, no death saves, you just died, which is true half the time you just straight up die, make a new character, so you put just enough role playing in your character, but you had to re realize that your player was probably going to die from some like, cheap trap or something and you just had to accept that you know, which is fine back in the day you know, that's why you have extra character sheets or extra characters ready to go Nowadays, most people like, you know, get annoyed if they if their character dies or they hate it. I'm like, dude, yeah, you, know, you should play first or second edition, man. First edition was more harsh than even the second edition was. The game did kind of get lighter as as the game progressed. I'll admit, more ways to like keep your characters alive. I think it's because people get so invested into it. But I think that it's still a game. There's still death and consequences, and there are ways to resurrect you. In first edition and second edition, that was really hard to do though. You can still do it, but. There was like cheap ways where you could like reincarnate your character so they could still come back, but they'd come back as like a completely different race, which was funny. That happened to me a few times while playing when I actually was a player. But that was way back in the day. I'm trying to remember the last time I actually played in a game, like as an actual player. I think it was a couple of years ago. But last time I played, I don't know. I didn't really feel the game. I mean, the DM was fine and everything with that. I just it was either I lost interest or or. Something like I said, maybe I'm just so used to the game of being the player or being a DM that it just I couldn't invest myself in it as much or something. And, it's, and the idea for the story was interesting. It was a pre, it was a, uh, um, uh, you know, it was already a, a campaign you could buy, you know, so you didn't have to plan everything out. All you had to do is run it. It was a, what was it called again? It was the one. I am deep told. High priest of Blibdulpulp, kneel in supplication before the Sea Mother, and be cleansed of the heresy you have committed here. Do not be afraid. Your sacrifice will be massively painless. Ah, such blasphemy in the face of the Sea Mother. A pity. You will be sacrificed. Your sins wash away like so much jetsam in the tide. I think you're gonna get washed away for boss time against Diptolt, the 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 shaman the the shaman of Blibdopulp. Yeah, that's an actual god. Uh, Blibdopulp is the oh yeah, you can't. I keep forgetting you can't stun bosses. Um, is a the sea mother. I think her avatar, if I recall, is a big old kraken. Uh, I actually messed with her when I was a player a long time ago. Um, I did actually mess with the Blibdopulp, uh, these guys. Oh, actually, he said Blibdopulp. Maybe he's a. Uh, a bull, not Bullywog, maybe he's a um, Kuatoa. Nah, I think he's a Bullywog. Um, but anyway, uh, Kuatoa are also worshippers of Blue to Pulp. But yeah, Avatar is a Kraken. You know, Kraken from like uh, Titan. Actually, no, the one from Titans is uh, Rise of the Titans or whatever. It's not a. Um, yay, we beat it. We beat uh, Bleed him. Beat him. Um, but yeah, Kraken's basically just a big old octopus. 
Or, yeah, octopus, I think. Anyway. Alright, what's... Actually, didn't I miss... Oh, yeah, I need to see if I can grab... Maybe I got the key for that somewhere, because it said the door went in the lock. Unless there's a back end for this. Hmm. I thought the urn would be, like, right here. Nah, it's probably around here somewhere. Oh, yeah, I gotta switch back to Stunning Blow. Yeah, we fought a boss a little early. Shouldn't we have already, uh... Shouldn't we already be ready to go and getting out of here? Nope, we got a bit more of this place to go before we leave. Yeah, the boss wasn't too bad. I mean, hit you for decent damage. It's mainly the magic um, that they can do. The lock won't open. Hmm. Ooh, what's this? Well, we got a lot of money, but... Oceanic Urn. You fi found the Oceanic Urn, an aquamarine stud gold urn hidden within the altar to blub de poop it should be returned to Jarek and Baldur's Gate. All right, we got it. Now we can just get out of here. But let's uh, collect the rest of the treasure. Man, that was easy. Man, no no problems, no no, uh, no major issues. Same old, same old. All right. Well, didn't expect that to go down so the easy. Lock won't open. Hmm. I can't open these doors. Well, let's keep exploring. Maybe we'll find the key somewhere. Ooh, maybe in here? Man, we got gold. A nice chunk of gold, nice. I will eventually spend it, but chapter three is where I'm gonna have to buy a whole new set of a. Uh... Hmm. What if I missed a the key somewhere? I know you can open those, I believe. Let me go back to that one. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh yeah, I still need to go back to that one room. No. Oh. You hear a noise. From across the room comes the sound of a door opening. Yeah, we open up the other room, so. Alright, uh, Halberd. Oh, I can't. Aw, oh, no. I'm carrying too much as it is. I'm carrying too Dang much it. As it is. <laughs> I actually. Uh, the reason I actually don't want to recall now is because there's a story element that happens because of that. Whoops. Alright. Is it over it. here? Well, you know what? I'll. I'll recall and recall back. I think that shouldn't script the story too well. Okay, well it, it it does for an extent, so alright, let's okay, the items are still there. Let's go ahead and recall. Because there's actually no way out of this place. Um you have to recall to leave, so or not an easy way, I have to run all the way back. So let's just recall. Yeah, as soon as we come back, dun dun dun! The urn is missing. The oceanic urn is missing from your belongings. One or more cunning thieves must have disguised themselves as members of the ship's crew and followed you into the sea cave, stealing it from you without you realizing it. Perhaps Jarek will know what to do. Yeah, it just kind of happens off screen. You kind of just get stuff stolen from you, so great. Um, so let me sell some stuff, grab that stuff inside, and then we'll call it. I was actually going to end the episode with um, that happening to me, but uh, because I accidentally. Um, let's see, what's the, that's the one with Sunder on it. Um, but because the game, uh, uh, I, I was too heavy, now I have to, uh, do this instead. That kind of, that kind of ruined the end of the, end of the episode there. Oh, well. Now yeah, what can you do? Let's see, I want to keep the amulet. Let's sell these rings. Yep, 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 yep. Because I want to get the rest of the treasure before we call it an episode. My shop carries the finest op okay, let's go back. Yeah, stupid game ruining my outro. Because <laughs> that's what I was gonna do. I was gonna like say, you know, you know, they stole it. What do we do? You know, that type of thing. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I mean, sometimes I get exactly the right ending for something, and then other times I'll just I'll ruin it at the last second. So. Yeah, let's grab this treasure. So. Yeah, grab this one. Yeah. Oh yeah, I still have to go to that other room and grab that other treasure. I don't even know what I grabbed. Probably a ring. I can't move it. Surprised you can't just open it from the other side. Hmm. All right, let's go back to that one one set of doors and see if we can open them now. Hopefully I can. I wonder if I could have opened them a little sooner, but I uh, didn't check around enough. I was hoping maybe it was a thing I'd like find a key by killing someone or something in the general area. And as far as I'm aware of, there isn't any 
scene where your stuff gets stolen. So if I walked into Baldur's Gate, I would have, uh, it would have happened anyway, from what I recall. So. The lock won't open. There it is. Okay, I just missed. What about the other one? There. I can't move it. I guess I just missed uh, clicking on the wall next to it. Warhammer, stuff like that. Up oh, another hidden door. For an ancient temple, they got hidden doors everywhere. You'd think they wouldn't be hiding stuff from their own people. But what do I know, right? Alright, oops. Big old scimitar popped up. Nice few items there. All right, time to recall back. So, well, all right. Looks like we got everything from the oceanic, the sea temple itself, but the oceanic urn has been stolen right up from our noses by a bunch of sea scurvy sea dogs. Yar. But where have the thieves gone to? Who's he going to sell it to? Are we going to meet up with some old enemies on our way there? Find out next time in the next episode of Baldur's Gate 2, of Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.